1 Corinthians 2, 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit. For they're folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? I really want you to understand this next sentence. But we have the mind of Christ. Can we all say that together? But we have... Verse 3, chapter 3, verse 1. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now, you're not yet ready, for you're still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Paulus, are you not being merely human? Or as the New King James says, aren't you just being mere men? I want to talk today about what does it mean to be spiritual or what does it mean to be mature because the apostle Paul's writing to a church that he says I couldn't write to you as those that were mature I had to write to you as people of the flesh what does it mean to be spiritual what does it mean to be mature let's pray into that God help in Jesus name amen go ahead and have a seat and let's do this So years ago, I was uh, eating at an all-you-can-eat buffet, and I ate way too much of the kind of food that you should not eat. And when I was leaving the all-you-can-eat buffet, I began to feel so ill that uh, I was in the car with my newly married wife, and I said, oh, you need to not pull out of the parking lot. I need to go back in to go to the bathroom. And I don't want to be crass, but I, I ran into the bathroom and made my way to a throne of sorts and just thanked the Lord that I was there. And it, and it was taking a moment there, and then someone came, the, the door opened, and someone came next to me, and, and I looked down, and I felt embarrassed for them because uh, a woman came next to me and she was obviously in the wrong place. And I was like, oh, bless her heart. You know, she came into the wrong restroom. And so, you know, you sort of look under there sometimes. Hey, listen, it's Youth Takeover Sunday. So I'm doing this a little more like what I would do if I was in youth group church, <laughs> just so you understand right now. But I kind of looked down through the stall and there she was. And I was like, oh, that, man, uh, skinny little shoes and skinny little ankles. And, you know, she's sure going to be embarrassed. And then someone else came in and they came in the stall next to me and what are the chances a second woman made a mistake and came into the men's restroom as well? And I was thinking, oh, bless her heart. And then I started noticing there were more stalls than there usually are, and I was looking for the urinal section, and I didn't see the urinal section. And at that point, it didn't matter how much I had, you know, finished. I finished up. I ran out, looked at the door. Sure enough, it dawned on me. I was not where I thought I was. I thought I was in the men's restroom. In reality, I was in the women's restroom. I ran, I ran out to my car where my wife was waiting. She saw me running. She decided to play a joke. She started driving away. I was like, this is not the time for jokes like, like this. You know, it's possible that you think you're in one place and you're actually in another. And the book of 1 Corinthians is written to a church that thinks of themselves as very spiritual and they think of themselves as very mature. And yet the reality about this church is that Paul is writing to a church that because they're spiritually gifted, because they speak in tongues, because they've got gifts of the spirit, they have assumed that they're spiritual and the apostle Paul is writing to let them know you are not spiritual at all. You think you're spiritual and mature. Well, I'm here to tell you you are fleshly and you're actually immature. 
He says in verse one here, I, I, I couldn't even address you as spiritual people. It's the word pneumaticos. Pneuma would be the word for spirit. I, I wanted to speak to you as people that are dominated by the spirit, pneumaticos, that you'd be dominated by the pneuma, by the spirit. He's like, I couldn't even speak to you as spiritual people. I had to speak to you as, to, as people of the flesh. It's, it's a, it's a Greek, the, the Greek word for flesh is sarx. Everyone say sarx. Like S-A-R-X, like sarks. He says, I couldn't speak to you as pneumatico, pneuma people. I had to speak to you like sarks people. People of the flesh as infants in Christ. And so he writes this letter to them and he's, up until this point, it's kind of, this letter is kind of, it's really been about Jesus. It's, the theologians would say he begins with Christology and then he speaks a lot about the Holy Spirit, which would be, pneumatology. He's now getting into ecclesiology. Now, this is a nice way of saying he opens the book of 1 Corinthians talking about Jesus and the Holy Spirit. He now is going to spend the rest of the book talking about Christians, specifically fleshly, carnal, immature, and yet they think they're in a different bathroom than they are Christians. He's writing to a group of believers that think they're one thing, they're actually another, and it is the burden of my heart today because even in a war, and I'm even concerned even right now with all the stuff going on in Israel, I'm bracing myself for the reactions of Christians. When we get into the political season, I'm bracing myself for the reactions of Christians, for what Paul says here, the, when you're characterized by jealousy and strife, are you not acting as people of the flesh? and not the Spirit. And if ever there was a need like we have, it's, it's right now. Because when I'm listening to people and say, I don't want to go to church because churches are so full of what? They say hypocrites. Paul would say, oh, there are all sorts of people in the church that are actually not hypocrites. The issue is actually not hypocrisy. The issue is actually the flesh. What you've got is a bunch of Christians that they think they're spiritual in the case of Corinth because they speak in tongues. I don't hear a lot of 21st century Christians boasting about their maturity because they speak in tongues. I mean, a few might, but in the first century for them, they're like, well, look at me speaking in tongues. Look at me prophesying. I must be spiritual. I must be mature if I've got all these spiritual gifts. That was the Corinthian issue. I, I don't see that now. I see now it's things more like I've been a Christian for so long or I've got so much knowledge of the Bible and I will watch people online with heavy doses of knowledge of the Bible slamming other people in jealousy and strife, acting like they're spiritual because they know the Bible. And Paul would say, are you not acting like a person of the flesh? And our culture looks and says, aren't they hypocrites? Because our culture can put a mirror up to us sometimes to recognize that something is expected of us that's other than just being experienced or knowledgeable. In our day, people think maturity is knowledge and experience, but Paul disagrees. Let me read to you what Paul says, going back a little bit in chapter 2, verse 6. He says, yet among the mature, everyone say mature, we do not impart wisdom, although it is, we do impart wisdom, although it's not a wisdom of this age. There is a tendency for people to think maturity means, I know all the most recent TED Talks. TED Talks are full of the wisdom of this age. Well, I'm very, I'm very knowledgeable of, of the philosophies of the world around me. The philosophies of the world, according to Paul, would be, according to Scripture, would be the wisdom of this age. He says, who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers, though, this is one of the wildest verses in the whole New Testament to me. None of the rulers of this age understood this. Understood what? The hidden wisdom. It was concealed. Now, this can mean Pontius Pilate and other rulers. I think it also means the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, I think it means Satan himself. None of the rulers of this age had understood it because if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If Satan knew what the crucifixion was gonna do, he would have never put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. Do you understand this? When Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn. The heavens were opened. Satan shuddered in that moment. None of the rulers of this age, under, do you understand that what looked like defeat when Jesus died was the ultimate victory where the blood was shed? But the, it's, it's hidden wisdom. If you've ever read prophecies and you're like, why is Bible prophecy so hard to understand? 
Let me give you the answer. Because it is concealed in a way that even the rulers and principalities themselves would have no clue what's going on unless it got revealed by the Holy Spirit, not own Holy Spirits. But as it is written, this is one of the greatest verses in the whole Bible, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. Everyone say pneuma. That's the word here. This is the Greek word pneuma. Through the pneuma. For the Spirit. How do you say Spirit in Greek? For the pneuma searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received, listen, not the pneuma of the world. We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. And that's why he says the natural person he doesn't get the things of the Spirit. But the spiritual person, they, they get it. He, he, friends, here, this is the entire sermon. Maturity or spirituality is not knowledge or experience. It is increasingly thinking and living by the Holy Spirit. If you want to know what's, what maturity, what Paul was saying to these Corinthians is, you think you're spiritual because you can demonstrate or manifest some gifts of the Holy Spirit. Or in the 21st century, he might say, you think you're spiritual because you've learned the words inspired by the Holy Spirit. But maturity is not knowledge or experience. Maturity is increasingly living and thinking by the Spirit of God. For we have the mind of Christ. For we have the mind of Christ. And to explain this, Paul describes in this passage that I've read three different types of people. Now, I've already read it, but there are three different types of people in this room. There are three different types of people that are watching online right now. Everyone in the world could be split up into one of these three types of people today, and I want you to do a little self-diagnosis, and I want God to do a work in us where he would actually make us spiritual. Number one, the first type of person he describes is, in verse 14, the natural person. Person. Everyone say natural. Now, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit. The na- number one, the natural person lives naturally. This is, this is the mantra. I, I hear this all the time. Bro, it's only natural. Girl, why'd you do that? Man, I'm only human. The natural person thinks and lives naturally. Well, well, why did you say that? It was natural. Well, why are you acting like that? It's natural. Why are you being like that? That comes naturally to me. The first person is the natural person. This is the, this is the, and I, I, there's just words that are helpful here. It's, there, there's a word here. It's, it's a psuchikos. It's where we get the word psyche. It's like, this is the person, the soul, the, the soulish person, the person that's living from their soul. This is when people say things like, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm an Enneagram three. That's what I do. I'm an Enneagram seven. That's what I do. I'm an introvert. That's what I do. I'm an extrovert. That's what I do. I'm a Myers-Briggs, INTJ. That's what I do. I'm I'm this. That's what I do. I was born like that. That's what I do. It's only natural. This is the mantra of the natural man that this is who I am. But the natural man, natural woman does not understand the things of the spirit. This is the natural mind. It's the natural wisdom. Anything beyond this, according to Paul, the natural person doesn't accept the, verse 14, the things of the spirit for they are folly to him. One of the stars of the Marvel Avengers series is, is famous for having s- spoken about monogamy and saying how monogamy is ridiculous. The thought that a man and a woman would get married and, and they're going to only be with one person. That the idea is monogamy, this is, the, this is the, the thought, monogamy is foolishness. There's no monogamy. You don't see monogamy in the, in the animal kingdom. Why would there be monogamy in the homo sapien kingdom? 
And it makes, that, that's the line of thought that a lot of people have. Hey, you, you and I were born to not be monogamous. You were, Mike Patz was not born to be with one woman. He was born to be with lots of women. Now, I'm not saying a lot of women would want to be with me. I'm just saying that the idea being that, that you and I were born, and it's just how, I'm just, it's just natural. That's, it's just to which Paul would say, the things of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, seem like folly to the person who is natural. And when people say, I'm just behaving in a human way, Paul says, that's exactly the problem. When you're just being human, aren't you just being merely human? Paul says, you are not supposed to live just merely human because if you belong to Jesus, you are no longer just merely human. See, the natural person may be a moral person, they may be an admiral person. They may be a good American citizen, Canadian citizen, British citizen, Nigerian citizen, but they do not know God. The natural person, they may be, there's even some of you in this room right now. You're wonderful. You're incredible. You're made in the image of God. You're beautiful on the outside. Beautiful voice, some of you sing. But there's some of you that are listening to me now. You are natural, and if you were to die today, you would have a rude awakening in your eternity because your spirit has not yet come alive. And that can only happen when the spirit of the living God resurrects a dead spirit inside of you when someone calls upon the name of Jesus. If you are a natural person today, I've got the greatest news in the world today. This is your resurrection day. This is the day that you get up from the dead, you meet Jesus, your sins get forgiven, you call upon him, put all of your trust in Jesus. The natural person thinks and lives naturally. I, when I was studying uh, religion at UF, I had New Testament professors that knew the New Testament backwards and forwards, atheists, agnostics. They knew the Bible, but they didn't know God. The natural person may know the Bible, and they may know morals, but they do not know God. Number one is the natural person, and some of you are that, and if you are today, I'm inviting you to something far better. Number two. Verse 15, he says, the spiritual person judges all things, but is himself judged by no one. The second type of person is the spiritual person. The spiritual person thinks and lives supernaturally. The natural person thinks and lives naturally. The spiritual person thinks and lives supernaturally, beyond just natural. They live by the Spirit. Now, I want to be careful how I say this because what I find a lot of right now is I meet a lot of people that say this, you know, I'm not really religious, but I'm spiritual. I hear that all the time. I'm, man, I'm not like, I'm not religious, like, but man, I'm a spiritual person. Like everyone wants to be a spiritual person. So I'm walking into Gainesville Health and Fitness this week and they've got all this decoration going on for Halloween coming up. And so someone's like, whoa, I mean, what's up with all the gore and the monsters? And, and the guy behind the desk said, ooh, we're just getting in this spirit early. <laughs> to which I couldn't help but say, which spirit? <laughs> we're getting in the spirit. It's a very legitimate question. When Paul is using the word spiritual here, he's using this almost like a capital S with holy before it, holy spirit, spiritual. There is a difference between the spirit of the living God and the unclean spirits of this world. Now, we get that because Paul's actually going to say right here, when he says here that, that uh, we have not received, we are those that we have not received. Now, verse 12, now we received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. So when God says something like, I want a husband and wife to get married, and monogamy is my goal there, and that's my expectation. The, the natural mind would say, that's foolishness. That's ridiculous. That's not the animal kingdom. That's not natural. That's not how we were born. The spiritual person, the one that's been born from God himself, is going to have God's spirit come in. They get enlightened. They're like, oh, that makes so much sense, and they get it. This is why Paul would say, when someone comes up to you and says, hey man, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual, the qualifying question is, are you, are you spiritual in the sense of the spirit of the world spiritual, or the spirit of God spiritual? Because there is a spirit of the world. There is a spirit of flesh, lust, 
materialism, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. There is that sort of spirit. The spiritual person, it says in verse 6, it says, yet among the mature we impart this wisdom that's not of this age or the rulers of this age, which is doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and a hidden wisdom. It's a secret and hidden wisdom. It discerns the difference between when you hear something like, whoa, bro, that is wise. The question is, is the wisdom that you're hearing the wisdom of this world or is it the wisdom of heaven? Because those are different things. The wisdom of this world is different and distinct from the wisdom of of God himself. This is also why when I, I will often meet people that say, that like one of the other wisdom of this world lines I hear a lot is, uh, we're all God's children. You ever heard that? I mean, I just think we're all God's children. We are all significant. We are all created in God's image. We are all image bearers. We all bear the imprints of God himself upon our souls. But... It says in John chapter one, as many as received him, put that up under the screen because this is important to understand what it means to be a child of God. Put, get that on the screen for me up here. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Verse 13, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a human's a husband, a human's will, but born of God. So this is where the scripture says, although all of us are made by God, everyone is not one of God's children until they receive Jesus Christ as their king, Lord, Savior, Messiah, chief, cornerstone, rock, refuge, fortress, all of that. When Jesus becomes your Lord, you become God's child. Up until then, the invitation is open. He wants to adopt you. He wants you to become his. You can choose to become his. But until then, someone is still natural and what scripture would describe as dead in their sins. Now, this is offensive because we live in a world that talks a lot about how you were born. I was born this way, and yet Jesus says you must be born again. When you get born again, I got born to Richard and Judy Pats. When I got born again, my father became God himself. There's something that happens when someone gets born, not just from natural descent, but born from God. They get a new nature. And, there's, it's, it's almost, it's, it, and what happens is it's like my phone. When I open my phone, my phone's got a bunch of apps. When I get on my phone, I can open up my apps. So as an example, uh, we have keyless entry, a few keyless entry places here in our, in our church where you can walk up there and I can now open up this basically door app and I get near there and if you kind of put your hip up to the door, it opens up it, like this little green light. It goes from red to green and you can walk through the door because now the thing is open. When you become a child of God, God opens a door. There's an open heaven to where there are new apps. Let me say it like this in verse 16. He says, but we have the mind of Christ. Say that with me. But we have the mind of Christ. Say it again. But we have the mind of Christ. So, so what this means is, just like I can open up my app and I can have, I've got, there's a Maps app, there's a podcast app, there's a calculator app, there's a FaceTime app, there's a Bill Pay app, there's a Game Time app to get into football games and see teams win that need to win. And there's all these kind of things that can happen where you've got the, all these different apps. The scripture says you now, when you belong to Jesus, when you become his child, you access the mind, the mind, the mind of Christ. Let me say it differently. To be spiritual means your worldview changes. You don't think the way you used to think. When people say wisdom of this world that everyone agrees with, it's all over Twitter, it's all over Instagram, it's all over TikTok, it's all over YouTube, it's all over Facebook, it's all over the, over the New York Times, you go, wait, ah, I totally understand why you all think that's wisdom, but that's the wisdom of this age, which is going to pass away. That is not the wisdom of God, which is only revealed by the Spirit. By the way, stop being surprised when natural people do not understand the things of the Spirit. I watch Christians like, I don't get it. Why aren't you understanding? They haven't downloaded the apps yet. Why don't they understand? You could go to Kayak and you can get any 
trip you want figured out for every different flight that there could possibly be because the spirit, watch, the natural person thinks and lives naturally. The spiritual person thinks and lives supernaturally. Paul says maturity is not knowledge. Maturity is not spiritual gifts. Maturity is not speaking in tongues. Maturity is not knowing your Bible. Maturity is, although that's important and experience is important, maturity is thinking and living by the Holy Spirit. So there's the natural person, there's the spiritual person, but there's the third. Did anybody pick up what it is? The fleshly person, verse one, chapter three. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual, but as people of the flesh. The third kind of person is the fleshly person. See, the natural person thinks and lives naturally. The spiritual person thinks and lives supernaturally. The fleshly person thinks and lives fleshly. Now, he says in verse one, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual, but as fleshly, that he calls them brothers. So in other words, these are Christians. This is what you would call a carnal Christian, a fleshly dominated Christian. These are people that are born of the Spirit, but they're not walking by the Spirit. They, they have the mind of Christ, but they're not using the mind of Christ. This happens to me all the time. Does anybody sh like close all their apps all the time? Does anyone else do that? I do that all the time. I'm like, I'm on my apps, I'm like close, 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 close. Which is a problem when I try to get in one of the doors because the other day I was trying to get in and I had my phone and so I went up, but the app only works on the door opener when the app is open. And so although I have the app, when I'm not using the app, I don't get in the door. And so then I saw someone, I said, hey, can you let me in? They said, oh, just, you know, just, just do, the, do the code. I'm like, there's a, also you can, a code. I'm like, I don't remember the code. That's why we have the app, because they changed the code or whatever. And I'm like, I don't know the code. They're like, well, you're going to have to, and I'm like, oh. And then I got to go find. Watch. It is possible to have the mind of Christ, and you're not using the mind of Christ, and the doors that... Christ wants to open, don't get open because you're not using the mind of Christ, which opens those. Let me, let me say it differently. There is an, an app on this that is the Maps app. How many of you guys live on the Maps app of your phone? How many of you like can't get to, you can't get to like CVS without your Maps app, right? You just type in like CVS, Walgreens, they're across the street from each other anyway. Either one doesn't matter. Just go ahead, Right? The, the fleshly, watch, the fleshly person thinks and lives by the flesh. That is, that what it means is the fleshly Christian, the carnal Christian, is like the guy that's got the Maps app, but instead of using the Maps app, he still stops at gas stations and asks for directions on hard copy maps. You're like, what are you doing? That is what Paul is saying to the Christian. He's like, wait, 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 wait. You guys think you're mature? You guys think you're spiritual, and yet you still fight, and yet when Israel gets bombed, you're arguing with people about, about all that. You're, you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna go get in arguments with people online. About, when, po when political season pops up, you're gonna go fight with people. You think you're spiritual because you believe in whatever, you, whatever point of theology you think you've got down pat, like because you understand pneumatology or ecclesiology or eschatology or whatever ology that there is. You think that's what makes you mature? What makes you mature, Paul says, is that when political season comes up, everyone else argues in the spirit of this age, you don't argue. You're gonna go vote, you'll be involved, but you don't act like the rest of them because you've downloaded an app that you open and use. The fleshly person, the fle he, he says, brothers, I couldn't even address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. Well, how, what, what else would that be? As infants. In other words, you guys are immature. I want you to imagine. Imagine a guy in our church went and asked a girl out. He's like, hey, gir hey girl, you want to you wanna go out? Man, let's just go out and just read some scripture together. She's like, oh, what a man of God, you know? And he's like, yeah, I'll come over around like seven, 17, you know? It's just like a good, you know, actually, like, like, well, I don't know what, you, you name the time. She's like, well, could it be like 7.30? And she, you're like, well, well, why? And she's like, well, because it, at that time, my, my parents will still be changing me. And he's like, what do you mean changing you? She's like, you know, like my diaper. My, my parents will be changing my, my diaper. To which she might be like, well, how old are you? She said, well, I'm 20. He's like, well, 
is there some condition? No, no, not really. Just, I don't know. I've just, I've never gotten around to changing myself. He's like, wait, wait, changing yourself? She's like, you know that feeling when, when again, this is youth takeover, so I'm going to be a little different. You, you know that feeling when it kind of gets warm, you know? It's like, and you could be in the middle of doing something, and you're like, do, have you ever thought how inconvenient it is to have to go to the bathroom when you're in the middle? Of, I never had that. I just... To which he'd say, so you're 20 years old, you go to UF? She's like, I do. You'll never see me getting up to go to the bathroom when I'm in one of those lectures. I hear every word of that thing. He's like, uh, let me check my schedule again. To f-. But Paul is writing to a group of people. They think they're 20 years old and mature, and he is like, you're still wearing Diapers? Like, I need us to get in that mode to understand how ludicrous Paul thinks it is. They think they're spiritual because they speak in tongues. And they're still arguing about Paul and Apollos where there's rivalries and envies and jealousies and strife. And and they're still living by the flesh. He says to them, wait, aren't you being immature? Verse 2, it gets even further. He says, I fed you with milk. Imagine a guy going out with a girl. And the girl says, well, he doesn't have a car. She does. She shows up at his house, 20 years old, gets to the house, sees something in his mouth. She says, wait, wait, what is that? He's like, oh, it's my bottle. <laughs> is it like candy? I knew there's like a little bottle, like, you know, like sour candy. No, 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 no. It's, it's milk. It's formula. Are you joking? He's like, no, no, no. You, formula, it's got all kinds of protein. I mean, I go work out, and then I get that protein. And I, I've, been, I've been doing this for 20 years. I know some people get over it. I'm like, why get over it, man? Just keep on doing this. I, I just, Paul says to them, I wanted to give you a steak, and all you could handle was la leche league. <laughs> Paul is described, he says, the fleshly person thinks and lives by the flesh. See, it's, it's really interesting. The, word, the Greek word is sarx. At, for, in verse 1, he says, I couldn't address you as spiritual, but as people of the flesh. It's, it's this word, it's like sarkinos, is kind of how it says. In verse 3, though, he says to them, for you are still of the flesh. It's, it's a Greek word. It's like, it looks like sarkikos, is kind of what it looks like. The first one says, by, by your constitution, your, all of us have flesh by constitution. In verse 3, though, he says, it's not just that you've got flesh as part of your constitution. You are now being dominated by the flesh. Not only, is that part, not only are you natural, you're being dominated by your natural. Paul says, God says, Scripture says, Jesus teaches, yes, you are flesh and bones. Yes, you are a natural person. But when you come to Jesus, he awakens something in you. He, puts down, he downloads apps on the hard drive of your soul. He gives you the mind of Christ. He gives you new nature. He gives you new abilities that when others never could have shown love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. Now you have self-control where others do not. You've got gentleness where others do not because the Spirit of God is living in you and the spiritual person thinks and lives supernaturally. The natural person thinks and lives naturally. The fleshly person thinks and lives fleshly. And Paul says, when you do this, aren't you acting merely human. Let me break it down with the two big areas of our culture. Let's talk about money. When it comes to money, the natural person hears about being generous or something like tithing. To the natural person, generosity looks like folly. To the natural mind, the things of God are folly. The natural person sees, share your stuff. They say, that's foolish. Wait, 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 what? Live on less than you make? Wait, what? What? Increasingly, that's what the, now, the spiritual person sees things spiritually. They recognize there's a day of judgment that's coming. They recognize that money is like a seed, that when you plant seeds, it's going to come back. They recognize that there's rewards in heaven one day. They recognize this life is not all that it is. And so they give, and they give increasingly. The fleshly person, they know that's true. Ah, the, 
they used to give, and they still give a little something. They're kind of like, they kind of, I don't know, they got one foot in and one foot out, and, and they don't give nothing, but they don't give like they used to because it's, it's really weird. You'll talk to fleshly Christians, and when they were in college and they were on fire and burning for Jesus, they're like, man, I just want to give God everything I possibly can. The older they get, the, the, their standard of giving goes up, their, their standard of living goes up, their standard of giving goes down. That's the fleshly Christian. Take sexuality. To the natural mind, the natural mind would say, Whatever feels natural to you is what you should do. This is what you have to be, that you, you decide who you are based on how you feel. That's the natural mind. That's how you were born. That's what comes naturally, sexually speaking. The spiritual person says, what does God say about me? What is it that God has revealed? He is the maker. I am the clay. My body is his temple. I will do what he says. I am who he says I am, and I can do what he says that I can do. And sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that's easy. There's a spectrum for all of us on how easy or hard that may be, but the spiritual person recognizes recognizes that you've got the mind of Christ. I will live within my body as the temple of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to follow and obey Jesus. The fleshly Christian, they're real Christians, but they look at some of the expectations of God sexually, and they'll say things like, that's just not sustainable. I know what God says about monogamy, but there's just no way I could ever be pleased just with one woman or one man and so right now, there's like rampant open marriages right now, for example. Like open marriages have become a massive thing. And, and I've even heard people say things like, is it really adultery if both of the spouses are okay with it? To which God would say, you do not determine the law of gravity, I do. And so the law of gravity when it comes to one's sexuality is not determined by whatever cultural moments you live in. It's determined by God. The, the, to the natural mind, the, the expectations of God, they're ridiculous. It's like, oh, I'm falling, you know? To the spiritual person, that we know it's hard. You're gonna have to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus. Oh, that's hard. We know that. We also know we've got the spirit of the living God living inside of us, and there's coming a day when anything you ever gave up for the kingdom is gonna be rewarded, and you know it. The fleshly Christian's like, ah, oh, I used to think that way, but man, that's just kind of hard. I've got a lot of, I've just seen a lot of life, and when I've seen a lot of life, I've just started to live more, I don't know, just, just got to be myself, and it's, that's just not sustainable. And so today, the call is I'm asking you to ask this question today. This is my application. I want you to, I dare you to ask this question. Am I growing in my spirit thinking and spirit living? Do we have that slide up there? Am I growing? This is really a way of saying, am I growing as a spiritual person? I don't, when I say spiritual person, I don't mean spirit of this world. I mean, am I growing as a person that is think increasingly living and growing, living by, thinking by the spirit of God? I want you to ask that question. Are you, when it comes to your money, are you getting more generous as time goes on or are you getting less generous as time goes on? When it comes to your contention, when it comes to political matters, are you getting more peaceful, kind, patient with people that are idiots? Or are you getting less patient? Like, cause I've heard people say, I'm, I got no more time. I've got no patience left than you are a fleshly Christian. Are you getting more self-controlled in what you say to people? Am I growing how am I handling my, my reverses and my resources? Reverses means how am I handling when people criticize me? How do I handle when I lose the job, lose the scholarship, lose the opportunity? Am I increasingly recognizing, wait a minute, I have a sovereign God who superintends over the affairs of this world. His goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. So when there's a reversal, I don't fret because I know God is on the throne and God's got my back. Or am I increasingly taking matters into my own hands, my resources? Am I increasingly stewarding my time, talent, and treasure for the things of God? Or have I become decreasingly involved in the things of God, ministry, serving, sharing, helping? The natural person thinks and lives naturally. The spiritual person thinks and lives supernaturally. The fleshly person thinks and lives by the flesh. Which one are you? Can you imagine what would happen if everyone in this audience decided to become truly spiritual? Can you imagine what would happen in America if all the people that have the mind of Christ 
would use the mind of Christ. Could you imagine what would happen if all the people that call on the name of the Lord would decide to live in ways that are reflected by joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, to, to live by the Spirit? We could have a revival on our hands. If you are a natural person today, if you are in this audience, online or in person, you are natural, here's my message to you. John chapter 3, you must be born again. Is that a political term? No, it's a Jesus term. You must be born again. You were born once of your mama. You need to be born the second time of your heavenly father. You must be born again. And none of it's going to make sense until you get born again. You're going to always be like, that makes no sense. That is ridiculous. Until you meet him, you're like, oh, I see it. Now I get it. It's better to give than to receive. Now I get it. It's better to be chaste than to be licentious. Now I get it. It's better to hold back than to retaliate in return. Now I get it. It's better to forgive than to get vengeance. Now I get it. Only the spiritual person gets that. If you're natural, you need to become a follower of Jesus today. You must be born again. If and some of you in this room have, tr you've like gone to church, you're like, man, I've tried. And I hate this because you haven't been born again yet. Get born again today. I'll give you a chance in a minute. Number two, there's some of you in here that are natural. And you need to, the second one, I'm sorry, you're fleshly. Some of you are fleshly. If you're fleshly, I need you to repent and go back to your first love. I need you to open the app and leave the app open. I need you to come to church. Oftentimes when you come to church, you get in worship, the app gets opened. You hear a sermon, the app gets open. I need you not to close the app at Sonny's Barbecue. I need you to keep the app open all week long. I need you to wake up tomorrow morning and have that kind of time with the Lord where you keep on opening and refreshing the apps so that the windows keep on open, the doors keep on opening as the week goes on. I want you to live in a way that is characterized by the Spirit. Recognize, even today, if you've gone back, there are some of us in this room that have backslidden. We have slidden backwards, and Jesus has said, come back to your first love, burn for me again. And then there's some of you in here that are spiritual. And if you're spiritual, I just want to say keep going. Be patient. Hang in there. You won't be sorry. Don't throw in the towel. You're going to reap if you don't faint. Don't faint. When lots of other people faint around you, don't faint. When other people turn back around you, don't. though none go with me, still I will follow in Jesus' name. I, I end it with this verse, verse 8. None of the rulers of this, understood, of this age understood this. For if they would have, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. In other words, they saw Jesus going to a cross. Right? That makes no sense. This Messiah is about to go die. That makes no sense. He, he claims to be innocent. He couldn't be innocent if he's going to die right now. Karma says otherwise. That makes no sense. And yet the cross makes no sense to the natural mind. But the cross is wisdom to those. It's power of God to those that are being saved. This week I read the story, and I ended on this, of a girl, single mom, lived in some tenement house in some poor area, and she just had to go to the store. She left her baby sleeping up you know, in this little tiny tenement house. She left her sleeping there, and when she went to the store on her way there, on her way back, rather, she had gotten some groceries to feed her child. She heard the sounds of the local fire trucks going, and they were racing toward what looked like her area. She dropped her groceries, ran to the house, and discovered that the house was going up in flames. She said, my little girl is in there. And they looked. They said, oh, it's, it's too late. The fire chief said, it's just too late. To which one of the firemen looked at her and said, your girl's in there? And she said, she is. Everyone said, don't go. You, there's nothing you can do. But he runs in. He says, I've got a daughter as well. And I would want her to live. He runs in, gets up takes the child, second story, they're ready, he throws the child, but as he throws the child who is saved, the house collapses and he dies. You fast forward 20 years, and there was a statue of this fireman in front of the firehouse, and there was a 21-ish year old young lady that was looking at the statue, to which someone said, oh, is, is that your father? She said, no. Is that your brother? She said, no. He said, well, who is that? She said, that's the man who saved my life. 
the rulers of this world had no clue that the king of glory would humble himself because in a world where kings always use their authority for themselves, the truest king used his authority to save. Is that your father? I don't deserve for him to be. Is that your brother? I don't deserve for him to be. Well, who is this Jesus? He's the man who saved my life on a cross where Jesus died. The wrath of God was satisfied. The sins of humans were wiped out. And the power of God came upon people to bring us into a kingdom where there is no end. In this world, we'll call it folly, but I call it a love story because no one ever loved you better than Jesus loved you.